So this was about the, the science, the scientific part of the talk, which I personally think is less interesting. Let's move on to what we do every day. We see patients. Uh, so let me take you through a couple of patients that I've seen over the past few years, and let's see what you think about those ones. So this is case number one. This was a lady who was 85 years old. She's been treated by her GP for four weeks because she's had shortness of breath, diagnosed by the GP as lower respiratory tract infection. Then after four weeks of antibiotic, the patient started going downhill and started to feel unwell. So the GP decided to ring the ambulance to refer her to the hospital for admission as sepsis secondary to a respiratory uh, infection. So the ambulance crew took the patient from her home and on their way to the hospital, the patient dropped her blood pressure. So they decided to change their destination rather than to go to the medical ward to come to the emergency department resource room to be assessed and treated by the medical team as a medically expected patient. The patient arrived to resource room. I was dealing with a patient in the cubicle next to her cubicle. Uh, I've been told by the nurses, She's here, we've informed the medical registrar, he's on his way to see her. We've just uh, cannulated her, took some bloods, and we did an ECG for her. Would you please have a look at the ECG uh, while we're waiting for the medical registrar to come? And this was my only involvement with this case. And just having a quick look at the ECG was enough for me to know why this patient dropped her blood pressure and what's the reason for her shock now. So I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to have a quick look at this ECG and to say it out loud, what's wrong here? Okay, 10 seconds is too long, I'm not doing this. Let's have a look. The abnormality here is we've got a T wave invergence in addition to many other, other abnormalities, but the main ones are T wave invergence in the inferior leads, so two, three and AVF. We've also got T wave invergence in the anterior leads, so V2 uh, to V5. When you see simultaneous T wave inversions in the inferior leads and anterior leads in the same time in a patient who's coming to you with this presentation, there is usually one thing that will cause that, which is acute pulmonary hypertension. And in the emergency medicine language, that will be massive pulmonary embolism. So this lady was found to have a bilateral submassive pulmonary embolism in her CTPA with right heart strain. And uh, it was a long discussion uh, with the respiratory team and um, between the respiratory team and the emergency medicine team regarding whether we thrombolize or not, but she responded well uh, to the IV fluids. And because of her age and her other comorbidities, the decision was not to thrombolize. And uh, actually she did really well and, uh, and she survived to discharge this event. So this is our first case that we're gonna talk about. So nice and easy. This is the CTPA of this lady. And as you can see, a nice, beautiful, big blood clot in her uh, left pulmonary artery. And actually there was another one in the right uh, pulmonary artery. This is Quoted from Life in the Fast Lane, which is a really, really important uh, website that I would encourage everyone to look at. So they said there that the simultaneous T wave inversion in the inferior leads, 2 3 AVF, and right precorded leads, V1 to V4, is the most specific finding in favor of pulmonary embolism, with reported specificity up to 99% in one study. If you do a quick literature review about pulmonary embolism uh, in relation to the T wave inversion, you will find loads. This is one of the uh, articles that talked about this, talking about simultaneous T-wave inversion in anterior and inferior leads as an uncommon sign of pulmonary embolism. And if you focus here, one of the authors of this paper is the famous Amal Matu. Here is another one talking about acute pulmonary embolism with ECG changes mimicking acute coronary syndrome. And actually they reported a case of T-wave inversions in the inferior lead and anterior leads. And they've done a literature review about this. So that's an interesting read as well to uh, have a look at. Here's the third one coming from the American Journal of Cardiology, uh, talking about the ECG differentiation between acute pulmonary embolism and acute coronary syndrome on the basis of negative T waves. So plenty of articles talking about this. Personally, I've seen it about six or seven times, and each time 
uh, it saved me. Uh, those are patients that can easily go down the route of acute coronary syndrome while they are actually having a massive pulmonary embolism. And this was our first case. Case number two is, I think, more interesting. Case number two is by far, I would say, one of the most challenging cases I've ever had in my whole career. So, 90, so that was a 39 years old male patient presented to Southampton University Hospital Emergency Department with one week history of feeling just generally unwell, seen by the GP, diagnosed him as having some sort of a non-specific viral illness. And uh, then he's had some diarrhea and vomiting for a couple of days. He walked into the department, didn't come in via an ambulance. He's had no past medical history at all. Looked unwell to the receptionist who saw him. So she felt that, oh, something is wrong here. So she called one of the senior nurses to see the patient. Um, and the nurse took the patient to the assessment room and took some ops. And the ops, the observations were as you can see. So the patient was tachycardic and hypotensive. So the nurse felt that felt really concerned and moved the patient immediately to the recess room. I was in recess that day. And uh, what we did immediately was we've got an axis and we've taken some bloods and, um, and we've sent a sample to, for a venous blood gas, in addition to so many other tests, as you would imagine. The blood gas came as this. So this is the actual blood gas of this patient. And as you can see, the patient was acidotic with a pH of 7.16. The PCO2 of the patient is 7.4 kilopascals, that is 53. Uh, in millimeter mercury. So that will, uh, that means that the patient has got an element of respiratory acidosis. But remember that this is a venous sample. So it might not be that high in the arterial one, but the, the bicarb is 18.2. The base excess is minus 10. This patient has got definitely a metabolic acidosis here. In addition, the blood sugar of this patient, the glucose was 11.7 millimoles. So that is 200 millimeter, uh, milligram per deciliter. And look at the lactate. We've got lactate of 12 here. So seeing this was really scary to me. This is a patient who's got something bad going on that I'm not sure about yet. Looking at the gas, so a few things that I spotted. We, we know that we've got metabolic acidosis here because we've got low pH, we've got low bicarbon and, and, and minus 10 base excess. We've got a blood sugar that is above 11, which is the cutoff to start thinking about DKA. So actually DKA was the first in my differential. So I've asked immediately for blood ketones and we did the blood ketones and they were normal. So not a DKA case, let's move on. The initial impression after DKA was that, okay, he's been having vomiting and diarrhea for two days, maybe he's severely dehydrated. And to be honest, he looked dry to me. Uh, so probably he's got pre-renal failure that caused this blood gas to look like this. So I've immediately started some IV fluids and I've given some antibiotics in case we're dealing with a possible sepsis uh, because things was, were not that clear at this point. And, uh, and I started having taking detailed history and doing a detailed examination. Nothing in the past medical history, no travel history, no other findings on examination, no fever. He denied any chest pain or shortness of breath or abdominal pain. So literally I found nothing. He said that he vomited two to three times in the last 24 hours and opened bowel and had diarrhea about three times in the last 24 hours. And that was really weird because this is not enough for a 39 year old male to be dehydrated to the point of having a lactate that is that high and to have a pre-renal failure. So when I hear this, I started scratching my head thinking, I'm missing something here. So anyway, he also started complaining of lower back pain while he was with me in ED. So I've done a full spine examination and full neuro examination thinking it might be a discitis, it might be a paraspinal abscess, and I found nothing. Everything was completely normal not even tenderness over the spine. And this was the biggest surprise. Renal functions came back as normal. And I was like, okay, 
badness is there, this patient is going in the wrong direction. I am definitely missing something here. So what I did was I decided that I will repeat the blood gas after one liter of fluid and recheck the lactate. And that was the biggest surprise. Lactate has gone up from 12 to 14, despite the IV fluids I've given, despite the antibiotics I've given. And at this point, I was really scared. At this point, I decided that, okay, I'm completely missing it. I'm losing this patient. I've asked one of my um, registrars who was with me in that shift uh, to come and have a look. He checked the patient with me. We both gone through, we've Googled all causes of high anion gap metabolic acidosis. And we've asked the patient about every single one of them. No toxicology, um, no history of alcohol, no, no nothing. We couldn't really find anything that would justify what is going on there. So my decision was two more tests that are still pending. I will get them and then I will involve every other hospital member in this case. I will call all the seniors in the medical and critical care teams because I'm losing this patient and I don't know what's going on. The two tests remaining were chest X-ray and an ECG. This was the chest X-ray that gave me the first clue about what was going on. So uh, this was an AP film. So I was expecting some cardiomegaly, but to be honest, not to this extent. This was just too big uh, for me to ignore as uh, in terms of the cardiomegaly, the cardiothoracic ratio. So that was the first clue. And the second clue and the final clue that gave me the answer to what's going on was in the ECG. So this was the ECG of the patient. So again, 10 seconds for you to have a quick look and see whether you can say it out loud, what is going on here. Okay, again, 10 seconds is too long. We're not gonna wait. This ECG has got three abnormalities that if you find next to each other, you should come up with one single diagnosis. The first problem in this ECG is the voltage. This ECG is of low voltage, as you can see here. Everything is tiny, despite the normal calibration of the ECG paper. So that's the first abnormality. Second abnormality, look at the rate. This patient is running too fast. So we've got tachycardia, we've got low voltage ECG, and we've got this, let's make it bigger. So if you look at the complexes in this ECG, they look really weird. Big complex, small, big, small, big, small. And that keeps happening. Big, small, big, small. Actually, this patient is probably in an SVT looking at this rhythm strip. So you've got, a triad of low voltage ECG plus tachycardia plus what's called electrical alternance. When you see this triad, there is only one single diagnosis here, which is massive pericardial effusion. So uh, I've taken the echo probe at this point um, and I echoed this patient myself. And, um, and it was the biggest effusion I have personally measured. I've measured about four centimeters uh, of uh, big pericardial effusion in this case. So let's quickly cover the electrical alternance because it was the clue in this case. So electrical alternance is basically when you get normally conducted complexes with alternate height, as you've just seen. And it's produced by the heart is just swinging backwards and forwards within a big fluid filled pericardium. And it is seen in about 30% of patients with cardiac tamponade. So have a look at this. This is not the patient, but if you imagine that your probe is here, your electrode is here, when the heart moves towards the electrode, then that will give you a big complex because the distance is not big and there is no effusion in the middle. When the heart moves away from the electrode like in here, then you've got farther, far distance and you've got fluids in between. That will give you a small complex. And the heart, as you can see, it keeps doing this to the electrode, big complex, away from the electrode, small complex, and that keeps happening with every single beat. So that's the explanation of why we see this. So let's go back to our case and find out what happened. 
few questions to think of about at the moment. First question is, okay, this patient has got an SVT. Can SVT per se, can SVT alone cause electrical alternance without pericardial effusion? The answer is yes. SVT can cause what's called pseudo-electrical alternance. So you will see the, exactly what you've seen, the electrical alternance that we've seen just with SVT without effusion. But SVT will not cause low voltage uh, in the ECG and it will not cause cardiomegaly in the chest X-ray. So uh, yeah, so we cannot really consider this the cause in here, even, uh, I mean, before the echo. Second important question here was, so this patient is now in a decompensated SVT. So shall we electrical cardiovert this patient? Shall we consider DC cardioversion? Because technically he's in SVT and he is hypotensive. Again, that was a big question that I have asked everyone in the team, including the cardiology consultant and the emergency medicine consultant who was there. And we all agreed that this will not be a good idea. We know that the SVT is probably because of the big effusion and because of all what's going on in the heart at this point. So the, and, and we know that the patient is shocked. So actually trying to sedate to cardiovert is not gonna help. What's gonna help is actually getting the fluids out. So we decided not to cardiovert this decompensated SVT. And the third question was, okay, shall we do the pericardial synthesis in the emergency departments or shall we take the patient to the cath lab to have it in a more controlled environment. And our decision was, he survived a long time within the emergency department. Why don't we just push him quickly and take him to the cath lab and get it done in a more controlled environment uh, with a caveat that if anything happens on the way, we will just stop and do it. So we all felt that the best place for this patient to be in is the cath lab. And we decided to move. So I took the patient myself to the cath lab, transferred the patient there. On the way, the patient self-cardioverted uh, his SVT back to sinus tachycardia, but he was getting just runs of non-sustained VT. I think I got older that day uh, and I've, had, I've developed some extra gray hair with that patient. So uh, successfully, we reached the cath lab. Pericardial synthesis was done there. An immediate one liter of hemorrhagic effusion came out and three liters were drained over the next 24 hours. Interestingly, uh, the lower back pain that the patient had in the emergency department improved to completely gone just with the fluids coming out of the pericardium. And till today, I do not have any clear explanation for this. It was a lower back pain, wasn't an upper back pain. And um, yeah, it just improved. So moving on, this patient had multiple investigations, including echo, CT, and MRI. He's had loads of blood tests, including HIV markers and autoimmune tests. And the outcome was he's developed cardiac sarcoma. So actually, this was my first ever interaction with cardiac cancer. He's had a cardiac myosarcoma, and he was also found to have liver, lung, and bone metastasis. And this is a very rare condition. You can see the incident here, how, how low the incident is. Remember, we're dealing with a 39 year old male, normally fit and well, not on any regular medicine, no previous past medical history, and two young kids at home. The life expectancy with this tumor when it reaches that far is a maximum of six months. So, this patient, I, I, I failed to follow up uh, to find out what happened later uh, to him. And I, to be honest with you, I intentionally tried not to follow up anymore um, because I didn't want to know what happens. Uh, but thinking about it now, I think this presentation was really confusing and challenging to diagnose. There was no clues anywhere in the history that I could use to expect that I'm going to end up sticking a needle into this patient's chest. And uh, this case was also very challenging to treat from the ED point of view, because, all of, the, because of the, all the complexities associated with the arrhythmias. So he's been in SVT, he's been in uh, non-sustained VTs, 
And that was all because of the pericardial effusion and the myocardial tumor that was causing all these uh, myocardial irritability. Uh, and also because pericardial synthesis is not a procedure that we see or do that frequent in the emergency department. So when it happens, when you need it, you're not gonna find yourself skilled enough to do it because you don't do it that frequently. So it was a very challenging case uh, that I wanted to share with you just to give you an idea about how shock can sometimes be tricky when they present. 